Well, brothers and sisters, it's been a long time since I can say this, but I'm the fill-in preacher today. Uh, I was not supposed to be here. Unfortunately, uh, Casey Shaw's wife, Courtney, uh, had to have emergency gallbladder surgery earlier in the week. She is doing fine and uh, recovering, uh, but Casey was unable to be here. Typically what I do the Sunday after Christmas uh, so that I can actually enjoy the time with my family, uh, I have someone who came out of here to return to preach, and Casey was uh, to be here today, and he was going to preach from Romans chapter 3. I'm not. So what's on the back of your info guide? You can just stick that somewhere else because you're going to have to go somewhere else in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. My subject today is making the best use of your time. I invite you, if you would, to stand as I read the text. Ephesians 5, 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Well, there's one thing we all share in this room. We're living in time. And I pray that you would cause us to think biblically, to think clearly, to seek to apply the truths of your word now to our hearts as we begin a new year, as we start 2023, as followers of Christ, as your distinct people. Teach us how to number and to spend our days. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I start with this question. What does the use of my time reveal about me? And there could be a myriad of answers to that. But I'm going to break it down into two simple truths. What does the use of my time reveal about me? Number one, it reveals what matters to me. Number two, who matters to me? So how I use my time reveals what matters to me and who matters. So how then do I make the best use of my time? Here's the main idea that will drive the sermon from this text. Making The best use of your time requires a careful walk and the wisdom of God. Let's start with verse 16, 15 and 16 are one sentence. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, I could preach an entire sermon on how evil the days are. Let's just start with this assumption. We live in some evil times. I don't have to preach, I don't have to use examples. Unless your head is in the sand and you're not paying attention to the world around you, you live in an evil time. So we're gonna, that's a given. Making the best use of the time. Making the best use could be one word, it is one word in the, in the text, redeeming. Redeeming, which, which literally means to rescue from loss. So rescue from loss, the time. And the word time is kind of a broad word. It can mean a specific time. Like, for example, we started this worship service at 930 this morning. It was a specific time for us to be here, and some of you did better at that than others. But anyway, 930. Specific. It can also refer to seasons of time. Like I'm, I'm in the midlife season. All in this room, you're in different seasons in your life. So whatever the time, specific or season, we are called to make the best use of our time. So we want to break this text down in two parts. Making the best use of your time requires a careful walk. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. 
Look carefully means to be deliberate. Uh, a lot of you have probably been to South Mountain State Park. I was talking to my kids about this. Now they got all these fancy bridges to cross the rivers and all that to get up to the waterfall. When I was growing up, I grew up fairly close to there. I had little yellow dots on the rocks. And if you didn't step where the yellow dots were, you were going for a swim. I mean, that's just the way it worked. You had to be deliberate in order to cross and to get to where you need to be. So we're talking about deliberate steps, looking carefully how you walk. Now, if we went to a bookstore, there'd be a lot of books written on time management, about accounting for every hour, about being exact with your planning and how the better you plan, the more you accomplish, et cetera, et cetera. There's some worthy ideas behind time management. I'll speak to a little bit of that later on in the message. I, I try myself to plan and account for my time. But instead of looking at everything and just in the moment, you also got to account for your time in terms of broader categories. Time to work. Time for relationships. Time for recreation. If you take notes, write that word on a piece of paper. Recreation. I want you to look at it for a second. There's a, there's a root word in there. What is it? Create or creation. Some of you have been raised that recreation is bad. Recreation is a good thing. There's a reason you feel better after you do some certain activities in your life. You just you're smiling. You, you feel it's restorative to you. And similar to recreation is rest. So look carefully. Be deliberate with your time. Now, the Bible does not go to a calendar here. Listen to what it says. Look carefully how you walk. Walk means walk at large or how you live your life. Look carefully how you live your life. Now notice, the scripture does not say, look carefully where you walk. Now that principle could be found other places, but that's not the point. The point is how. The focus is on how you walk, how you go about your life. Now just go back to the beginning of chapter five and look at verse one. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So this how is defined here in verse two, that we are to walk in love. So that assumes then that in my walk, I am interacting with other people. Are you noticing how quickly in our modern age, people are retracting from others. They're pulling back. I think it has a lot to do with the stress of people and how they're using their time and they, their minds are so jumbled up, their hearts are so jumbled up, they don't know how to interact with other people. And here's what the scripture is telling us as followers of Christ. We're to walk in love. Something distinct about us. And, and we don't get to define what that looks like it's been defined for us in Jesus Christ. So the issue lies in not how much I accomplish with my time. The focus is, in, is on who I am as I move through time. Now, I'm not arguing here that, that I'm to waste time. The scripture speaks to that in other places as well. Here's what I'm saying. It is possible to accomplish a lot in life and still be an absolute sinful rascal. It's a possible to accumulate a lot of things and be a miserable human being. So we are to be deliberate in what happens in our daily walk. So I want to go ahead and ask a so what question here. Is my walk influencing the investment of my time? So is my walk with Christ 
influencing how I use my time or is the use of my time influencing my walk? In other words, I'm just letting life happen to me and as I move through how time's being dictated for me, it's influencing how I walk with Christ. So how I use my time influences my walk. Now, the first time I ever spoke on this subject this way was a long time ago, and it was before this. Now, I'd have grossed some people out in this last thing, but used to, used to, people who were sitting at stoplights who didn't go were picking their nose. And an old man blessed my heart this week. I looked in my rearview mirror, he was after it. And I mean, <laughs> people aren't picking their nose anymore. They're looking at this thing. And it's gotten so bad now, have you noticed? You can honk the horn, and they still. Now, just think how much time all these people could save us if they would just put this down and let us all move about this city and wherever it is we're gonna go. This thing, who in the world saw this? Some of you, this is all you know. You're, you're listening to me thinking, well, well, you, all I've ever known is this, this thing is a part of life. This thing has changed how people spend their time. And those of you who are sitting here older, I've watched you in restaurants and places in public. This isn't just a young person problem anymore. This is a pervasive issue that our noses are stuck in the phone. Then there are those of us who think we have to constantly work. Now we can hide behind this, gentlemen and ladies, well, I gotta provide for my family. So in order to provide for your family, you work and you work and you work and you work and you do overtime and you work and you work and you, and you know you, you, feel, you got this feeling down in your gut but you think I'm, I'm succeeding, I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta work. I just have a question for you. If you're really successful and you're really prospering and you're really making a lot of money for your family, aren't you profitable enough to somebody else that they, you don't have to work 70 hours a week? Just think about that. There's, just a worthy thought. Work is not the defining thing. Now, there's another problem. There's another problem. There's some people who don't account for any of their time. The word the Bible uses for it is lazy. If, if you, are you watching what's happening in the world? There is just these two polar opposites. It's either workaholics or people who don't do squat. I mean, it's just nothing. There's no middle ground anymore. People are living on the extremes. It's because life and the modern world is shaping what people do with their time. So here's back to my question. Is my walk influencing the investment of my time? Is my walk with Christ? So how does that happen? How does my walk influence the investment of my time? I'm in Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of, is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So you, you really could ask the question this way. Am I patterning my life after the world? That's what to be conformed means, to be stamped into the mold, to be patterned after. Am I patterning my life like the world, or am I being transformed by the renewing of my mind? Let's just talk about pace for a minute. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, some of you are headed to big hardship in your life. Either your health or the relationships around you are going to disintegrate. You were not made to keep a constant pace 
of going, going, going. And parents, I want you to listen to me. I, I get alarmed when I talk to some young people and children about how much they do. Why is it that more people in their adolescent and 20s and 30s are being medicated for anxiety than ever before? I think it's because of the pace. And if you don't keep it up, something's wrong with you or you're guilty. Question. And I know part of it's the anxiety of being scared of people. You don't ever see children outside anymore. Have you noticed? You're just not outside in neighborhoods playing. It's just childhood is disappearing. Childhood is a beneficial time. It's a beneficial season of life. You as a family need to check your pace. Your resources, your money, the things you own represent the investment of your time. How are you using those resources? I guess I'm the only one that's ever done this. I have used my resources to buy things that stressed me out. Because I thought they were going to make my life better. (laughs) How about your family and just relationships in general? Are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind in terms of scripture permeating you as to how you see your family and how you see relationships around you. Now I'm gonna make a statement about my life, Jeff Long. The more I try to do, the more my walk with God breaks down. The more I try to do, the more my walk breaks down. I need wisdom to know what I must give myself to. Second point. Making the best use of your time requires wisdom from God. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. Unwise means lacking discernment. This is a sidebar. (laughs) When your 14-year-old says, I can't believe you don't trust me. It's not an issue of trust. You don't have discernment. Parents, you better learn this one. I'm getting into the parenting seminar for teenagers in a couple of weeks. You better learn this one. Don't, Don't make it a moral discussion about whether or not you trust this individual. They're 14. Their brain's not fully developed. I love you. It's not fully developed yet. And part of that is applying wisdom and discernment. You know why we do this as parents, young people? Because I remember when my dad let me drive a car when I was 16 and some of the things I did. Thank God I'm alive. Amen. Going from preaching to meddling, young people. Moving on. To be wise means to be discerning, to apply wisdom. So where does wisdom come from? Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. So if the Lord gives wisdom, then the Lord is the source of wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom comes from the word of God. God has spoken. He has given us his word. He has recorded for us what he has said. It is full of knowledge which leads to understanding. The Lord gives wisdom. 
It doesn't come from carrying a Bible or sleeping beside a Bible or carrying the car around in your car until next Sunday. It doesn't come from sporadically hearing somebody else talk about the Bible. It comes from hearing, reading, meditating on, memorizing the things of God. And then wisdom must be sought and applied through prayer. James 1, 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask God. Now listen to the rest of it who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. That means God knows you don't have the wisdom. He knows. So when you ask him, he doesn't go, God, come on. Can't bully. Ask me. Early on when I was pastor and one of the younger staff members, I was in the illustration I'll show in a second. I was very young myself, but he was much younger than me. And we were walking, I still remember, we're outside the office area over there in the parking lot. And, and he, he said, Jeff, I have a question for you. He said, every time I hear you pray, you ask for wisdom. And he, and he was asking it like perplexed. Like, why do you always say that? I said, brother, I'm 35 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. None. I, I don't know. The only way I'm ever going to know what to do is from God. And God promises if I don't know, if I will ask him, he will give it. Wisdom is gleaned from the word of God. So the wisdom of God, if we're putting all this together now with Ephesians 5, should dictate how we use our time. Convictions drive our actions. What we believe results in what we do. You agree with that? That's just an axiom of life. This is true for the pagan. Whatever you believe drives what you do. So here's my question then. Is the investment of my time revealing wisdom from God? And this is tied more to, when I talk about investments, more to more than work and success. There are lots of places Scripture reveals to where we're to invest our time. We're to invest our time in fellowship with God Almighty. We were made in the image of God to know God. Your dog doesn't know God and can't. You uniquely are made to know God. Ephesians 5 is going to go on. It's going to talk about investing in the relationship between a husband and wife. Then it's going to pick up children and the reverse of children to parents. And hear me. Hear me, because this is breaking down quick. I had a long conversation recently with a couple. If you're a Christian, the Bible says for you to honor your father and mother. That never ends. Honor them. Now listen, some of you who have adult children, the obedience ended the moment they got married. But honor continues. And part of honoring is just time. To be a part of the body of Christ, the church, involves time to come and to set aside time to come to the public worship, to serve somewhere. Work involves time. Now, I want you to hear me on this. I want to jump ahead here. (laughs) Every retired person almost I've talked to said, I don't know how I got anything done when I worked. Now I still work all the time. Let me tell you why you're doing that. Everybody want to hear something? God made you to work. It's pre-fall. Work is a good thing. God designed you to do something, to accomplish something, and to find satisfaction in that doing. That never ends. So I encourage you, find something to do. I'm blessed every week when I watch many, most folks are, are, are senior adult people who have retired. Over here working in PCO, they're working. 
laboring. You're to serve other people. You're to love your neighbor, to care for others. And here's another place God tells you to use your time. Rest. Rest. Rest is not laziness. Rest is a necessary part of life. This pastor almost ended ministry because he would not obey God. Rest. This is a quote. A man named a doctor, a physician, Richard Swanson, wrote a book called Margin in 1992. It's still a worthy read. The illustrations are old, but he said, quote, We jump at the alarm, but we sleep through the call of the Almighty. I'll read that again. We jump at the alarm, but we sleep through the call of the Almighty. Life's just being dictated for us. Go! Hurry! And we're ignoring what God's saying. Whether we are following the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God, it is revealed in how we spend our time. I'm reading from Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But the, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Everybody hear me. The reason you don't read your Bible is because you don't want to. It's not because you don't have time. You choose what you want to do. Every one of you. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Prospers. Now some people would grab that and say, God wants us to have material success and pleasure, because that's what the world wants, material success and pleasure. That's the focus to succeed. But true prosperity, as defined by the Scripture, comes from seeking and applying God's wisdom to our lives, both in specific moments and in seasons. Because when we have a biblical purpose, it leads to biblical prosperity. And the opposite of that is true. One of the things I've done throughout my Christian life is to read biographies of Christian people who are dead and gone. I have never read a biography of a living Christian, and here's why. Because too many people have disappointed me in their lifetime. Nobody's perfect, but I'm going to wait till you're dead to read your biography. But I've read these people because I'm intrigued with what God has done in their life. And when you read these biographies, there is a common denominator that flows through influential believers. And I'm not just talking about pastors here. I'm talking about followers of Jesus, is that they had very specific and narrow focus for their life. They were deliberate. And the one that has impacted me the most was a preacher. His name was Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards actually wrote out the resolves for his life. So long time ago in my 20s, I wrote out the major categories of the resolves for my life. And I'm going to read them to you. There's seven. Now, there's subcategories. There's multiple things underneath each one. I'm not going to bore you with that. But I'm going to read you the seven things. And, and some of you are going to grade me poorly, and I deserve it. But I will stand before God over these things, and these things all came from Scripture. Number one. Resolve to have a passion for the Lord that is all-consuming. Number two, resolve to love Celeste as Christ loves the church. When our kids were little, 
and they got old enough to where they wouldn't burn the house down if we left them for 10 minutes. Celeste and I would take a ride. We still do that. And they're gone. We just go take a drive. Number three, the wording on this has changed because I now have adult children resolved to love Jacob, Anna, Mary Claire, and Andrew and their spouses from the heart of the Father. Number four, resolved to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season. Number five, resolved to be a servant leader in the church. I'm going to take a sidebar here again. Here's what I learned when I became pastor. I don't mean this mean. You would tell me what to do. That's when I about burned out and was done. And then I decided one day, God tells me what to do as a pastor. And that's what I'm going to do. That doesn't mean you serve me. Oh, no. <laughs> no. We serve together. Together. That's what I believe at the core of who I am. We serve together. If somebody's being neglected in the life of the church, it's not my fault. Primarily, it's our fault. That's my fault that I'm not leading you well enough to do that. But we serve together. Number six, to maintain my body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Number seven, resolve to be a continual student. This is my prayer with these things and the subcategories that go with them. It was this sentence that I read in Jonathan Edwards' Resolves that turned me on my ear. He wrote, and I quote, Resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. One of the greatest blessings of my life has been to stand at the bedside of a brother or sister in Christ who've looked at me and said something like this. I'm not perfect. But pastor, you need to know I have no regrets. That's my prayer for you. That you come to the end of your life and you have no regrets. And that's only going to happen, brothers and sisters, is if you make the most of your time. The world's going to shape you the way it wants you shaped. But God will shape us into the people he wants us to be. Now, here's what's happening. Some of you feel a lot of conviction. Maybe you even feel bad. Here's what you need. Conviction must be understood with grace. God is gracious enough today to remind us of how to spend our time. And only by God's grace will we grow. I'm going to go back to my seven things for a moment. Every December 31st, I sit down with these things. I do it throughout the year, but I, I draw an arrow down or up. I'm going to confess. The majority of the seven this year are down. Not up. But by God's grace, that won't be true next year. By God's grace. So brothers and sisters, let us trust in the one who saved us to live in us and through us every moment. Let's pray. Lord, we're going to sing in a moment, I give you my life that the whole world might see that there is hope in the power of your saving grace. There's hope for us 
In an evil age, there is hope for us as followers of Christ. There is hope for us as the people of God. So Lord, let us not neglect the things that we ought and give ourselves to the things that we should. And Lord, that we would follow you and trust you and walk with you in these all the days of our life. We plead and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and declare this song together.